The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! Right, and hello and welcome into Views from the Sidelines off of a uh, week off hiatus. Link was a little busy with work. No big deal. Um, that's Malik Hill. I'm Joey Tysick. And uh, we didn't talk about the Super Bowl <laughs> because of last week, which is wild. Because it honestly, to me, as soon as the Super Bowl ended, it just felt like now it's been months away. That like football season is long <laughs> gone. But it's only been two weeks. I'm ready to get to the draft. Yeah, that's like I, I think yeah. for the Lions fans, we're like, let's get to the off season. What are we gonna do? What what moves are going we gonna make? We got lots of money. We got draft picks. Um, it should be fun. But um, we wanted to talk about the Super Bowl really quick, just to kind of go over everything. Um, I ended up watching the game, and it was super boring. First three quarters. Yeah, the ending was good. I, I appreciate the ending. It was nice. Um, went into overtime kind of cool and unfortunately though when it went into overtime you just felt like yeah, okay the Chiefs are gonna win I, th- I felt it on the last drive even um that they were just gonna make that comeback so where do you put one where do you put Patrick Mahomes whether you like right now obviously he's number one but where do you put him in the greatest of all time at this point is he right behind Brady and then where do you put this Chiefs team do you think they can keep winning or I don't know. Do you think they're going to eventually stumble? Where where do you where do you sit right now with this team and Patrick Mahomes? I would put I don't have a list ready to go, but I would put Patrick Mahomes probably in the 7 to 10 range of the top 10 right now. Okay. He has the greatest start to a career in NFL history. Mhm. But he still has a long way to go. Yeah. He's on track to be the greatest. Right. But Tom Brady had three Hall of Fame careers basically in one career. Mm-hmm. Peyton Manning is still known pretty much as like the greatest regular season quarterback of all time. Mm-hmm. I think Drew Brees is disrespected all time. He was unbelievable in New Orleans. I'm just talking about modern quarterbacks right now. Yeah, You got Aaron Rodgers, who some people say is the most talented QB of all time, but he just hasn't won enough. Haven't gotten to the 90s yet. Dan Marino, Joe Montana, who's also 80s. John Elway, who's also the 80s. Mm-hmm. Brett Favre, who's in the Hall of Fame. Uh, the list keeps going. Yeah. I, then you go back to the 80s and the 70s. It, I can't put them all the way up there yet. Because okay. there are people that are already cemented with gold jackets. Mm-hmm. Now, has he already accomplished what some Hall of Famers haven't? Yeah. Yes. Statistically and ring-wise, he's already ahead. Right. Of what some of the greatest have ever done. A lot of people from his era say Dan Marino was the best quarterback they ever saw. Mm-hmm. Dan Marino got to one Super Bowl in yep. his second season. Never got back. Part of that is because he plays in Miami. We're not going to go d- deeply into the whole quarterback thing. Maybe we could do that another day. But, yeah, I, I can't put Pat all the way up there yet. Yeah. And it depends on what you weigh uh, as far as Hall of Famers and things like that, it, it's the same boat when you get into to basketball. A lot of people, like, if Charles Barkley would have won a championship, he he could have been. If he beat Jordan, he's sky. probably almost top 10. Right. If he beat Jordan that one which, time. Which is crazy because you say that one thing and you say, oh, Charles was close to top 10. But because he didn't, people think that's crazy talk. And they're like, no, he's way, way down there. He's a great player, but he's down there. Uh, so it's crazy that it changes the narrative like that. Um, I personally kind of am with you. I think I would put him higher, definitely. Um, like, easy top five. But I-, I agree with you in the fact that he has to keep the trajectory going because he already has the hardware to keep up with all those guys. It's just that he needs to keep the trajectory of the stats to be there in the all-time lists. 
by the time it's all said and done. And I think he's going to get there. I don't think it's going to be easy or hard for him, actually. Uh, the thing that's crazy to me is, you know, all your, like, as you grow up as a kid, you think everybody talks about the year, the era prior, and they talk about, like, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, in football, even Tom Brady, even though he's into our adulthood. But you keep thinking, like, who's going to take that next step? But we've been able to see guys like LeBron, who's competed with Jordan um, as who's the greatest of all time. Steph Curry is the greatest shooter of all time. Now we have Patrick Mahomes, who is competing with Brady and others for the greatest all-time quarterback. And it's like we are seeing generational players in our own time period. To me, I, I don't know about you, but when you sit back and, and think about that, it's kind of crazy because all your life you grow up and you're like, Every parent and everybody in that era just says nobody could ever live up to what Jordan did. And as much as we hate on LeBron, he's doing that. And so it's just crazy to think about, in my opinion. Um, do you ever feel that way? That like, like if you take a step back and you're like, wow, we're actually living through some of the greatest players the sport has ever seen. Do you ever take there's the time a, to think about there's that? There's a grumpy old man side of me <laughs> that doesn't like to acknowledge it. Yeah. Because I'm <clears throat> logical and I I see the level of talent is at an all-time high mm -hmm. in both football and basketball. <clears throat> but listen, man, I grew up watching the Detroit Pistons in 2004 and 2005. Mm -hmm. They were winning games like 72 to 65. Yeah. There's a certain like type of basketball that I loved and enjoyed watching. Yeah. Having like six different dudes average over thirty just is strange to me. It's incredible, yeah, but it's it's strange to me, and it, it sounds like I'm a hater. I might be, <laughs> like I said, there's a grumpy that's okay. old man. That, that's okay. I'm a hater most of the time. So. Yeah, but honestly, in terms on the football side, mm -hmm. I think the quarterback position is kind of at a low. You think so overall? Do you remember in 2011 when Drew Brees and Peyton Manning and Matt Stafford and Aaron Rodgers all threw for over 5,000 yeah. yards? That's the thing. That when was the last time that happened? I do think that's, that's an interesting point because, like, you see numbers and touchdowns and things are up. But yet every other, like, statistical category is kind of down. Listen, the, the talent level of quarterbacks are, are at an all-time high. Mm -hmm. The level of quarterbacking is not at an all-time high. Yeah. Do you and think, that, to me, that's not grumpy old man. That's a fact. Do you think that's something to do with, like, because people have been talking about how, like, they're not, like, defenses are not allowing the big play as often, and they're keeping everything in front of them. Do you yeah. think that's part of it, that they're they're not playing I'd say that's that a way? part of it. Defenses have adjusted because players are so talented right now. Receivers are so dangerous. Quarterbacks can chuck it so deep. But also, I think, like going into the 2010s, the, the NFL players, NFL defenses were still allowed to play like tough brands of defense. Yeah. And Drew Brees, not the most mobile guy. Peyton Manning, not the most mobile guy. Aaron Rodgers was known as like a top three most mobile QB in the league. <laughs> right. In 2011. Mm -hmm. And Matthew Stafford could have run around. He was a gunslinger. Mm -hmm. Matthew Stafford was more in like the Brett Favre mold. Yeah. I, I don't know, man. I just think. The level of like coaching and defense was at an elite level. You still had like Hall of Fame coaches mm -hmm. in the game at that time. Yeah, you, you still and, had guys like Troy Polamalu and Ed Reed yeah, in the game. And like, yeah, and defense is, yeah, defense was, ev I mean, offense was evolving. Mm -hmm. People were starting to pass it more. Drew Brees was throwing it like it was almost no huddle the, the way he was going so fast. Right. Yeah, but like I don't to, know, man. I'd like, like to know how Peyton that Manning happened. Peyton Manning threw for almost 5,500 yards. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to know how that happened. Like, yeah. Because I, I do go back to that every once in a while, and you're like, you see the numbers, like, this year, like, Goff and Tua, maybe Josh Allen, were, like, the only guys that got over 4,000 yards. Like, what were those guys doing back then that they got 5,000 yards? And I know that didn't happen every year. But yeah, it, it it was a weird, a weird time, I guess. I think the way the quarterback position was looked at at the time was different. Like nowadays, these quarterbacks, like Josh Allen, 
he was like he was top ten in the league in rushing touchdowns. Mm-hmm. I think he was almost top. He had like seventeen rushing touchdowns. Him, him and Jalen Hurts were double digits. Yeah, Jalen Hurts, Josh Allen, Lamar Jackson. Mm-hmm. The the running game is like a major key part of what they do. Yeah, and even though teams know it, these guys are so athletic that they're they're still so dangerous mm-hmm. that they're going to take off and make plays. Right. That is just as important as sitting in the pocket and throwing touchdown passes nowadays. Yeah. In 2011, you had to sit in the pocket and make decisions, mm-hmm. and you had to be accurate, and you had to be on time. And as offense was evolving, those all-time elite guys like Peyton Manning and Aaron Rodgers and Drew Brees, the offense went up and they went up. Mm-hmm. It's it's really interesting seeing the differences. Yeah. No, I agree. That, that, that's a good point, too. Because I, I also think, like like you said, I think – that's the hard part is because there's so many good quarterbacks in the league right now, but yet statistically it's kind of down a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. And this is in a time where football is supposedly tailored mostly to offense. Mm-hmm. Quarterbacks get all the calls. If you hit somebody the wrong way, it's either unnecessary roughness or it's targeting. Mm-hmm. All these things are tailored to the offenses. And I don't think any of these guys are breaking Peyton Manning's record. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think, so. think it's happening. No, I, I don't think so either. And that, that's the same thing with like running backs. Like we keep talking about tandems every year and stuff. And the, the game is just kind of evolving. Um, but but to circle it back to basketball where we started, like it we started is, with the Super Bowl, but we think we went to basketball, right? And then we bounced that's a good around. conversation. But yeah. like to go back to the basketball aspect of like offenses being too crazy nowadays. There needs to be like a middle ground because that is, I think the like late two thousands going into the twenty tens was the ultimate sweet spot. Yeah, because the only time back then that you had thirty point uh, a night scores was like AI, Kobe, and Tracy McGrady, D Wade hit thirty. Yeah, I think it, one season, but it was only like one or two guys, maybe. Yeah. It was um, special when you saw somebody average over thirty. Yeah, and now, right now, we have like three or four. I think. Yeah. Cause it's Joel, Luca, um who's the other Shea one? Shea is averaging thirty. Shea. There's one other I feel like I'm forgetting, but We probably are. It's around four or five people, I think. Yeah. So I don't know. And I this Giannis, is something, I think Giannis is averaging thirty. He's close, if yeah. not. Uh but that's the hard thing, because like like you said, we grew up with the Pistons. Pacers matchup, yeah, which was like '60s a lot of the times. Which is this? It was also because the the O four Pistons had statistically the greatest defense of all time, right? So that was a part of the reason. Yeah, but still, it was like when you got into the playoffs, it was like like grind down style of basketball, mm-hmm. and and it's not one of those like boring defensive matchups. It was like it was fun to watch, fun yeah. back and forth, like people blocking shots, stuff like that. Um, good defensive play. So there needs to be like a middle ground. And the reason I bring this back up is because this sways right into All-Star Weekend. Oh, boy. And this is where, like, the NBA, it's a tough thing because the radio was actually talking about this the other day. NBA ratings are up right now. But it seems like the hardcore fans dislike it because there's too much offense. There's too much uh, free throw shooting. And there's basically no defense because the defense can't do anything. And the other thing that I wanted to tie into all of this is we're beginning to see that a little bit in the NFL where viewership is up. This was one of the highest rated Super Bowls. We know part of it is Taylor Swift. But people are enjoying the game, but the diehard fans are disliking it because it feels like no defense can be played at times. So it's really, it's a weird spot in these two major sports right now where the game is evolving and viewership is up, but they're taking away almost from the diehard fan base. And I don't know how that's going to go moving forward. Well, I would say they're catering to the new diehards, which are (laughs) NBA Twitter, which is some of the, I'm not even going to go. But the problem with that... (laughs) Being a diehard Twitter follower, yeah, NBA Twitter is like not eighty percent toxic. Is that and twenty percent actual bas- basketball talk? I was gonna say I don't hate to be completely rude, 
but a lot of them don't have the basketball IQ. Not at all. That, yeah. Most of them don't know basketball. Or the history, and that's like... They, they follow individual players. Right. And they may be a fan of a team, but they barely understand what's actually happening with their... Yeah. And this is the wild part, too, is like, this becomes where me being only at 31 years old makes me feel like an old guy. Me too. Because yeah. I'm like, not even, yeah. Right. I mean, you're my brother's age and like me and my brother grew up getting like basically like basketball almanacs, looking at all these stats, looking at history from the 80s, That's what I would the do. 70s. And we like <laughs> yeah. learned because we loved basketball so much and we just ate it up. These kids today. And then you play all the old, you play the video yeah. games and you know, people say video games are out of your mind. Well, I learned about older players because of these video games and things. So I have like a, a pretty good knowledge. We had a joy of the the game. Exactly. <laughs> All throughout the years, we had a joy of the game. And it was exciting learning about things from the past. Mm -hmm. And so now yeah. that leads us into All-Star Talk. Because the All-Star Weekend what what have, what have they done to my boy? <laughs> what have they done to my child? Uh, yeah, it's... Every year you talk about like the dunk contests and things, and you don't think it can get any worse. And then Jalen Brown enters the building. Listen, white glove on the left hand, and tr d jumping over a five three dude in a chair. I wish I could yeah. find my text messages. I can't remember if it was to you and Chris or if it was to my brother, but I texted somewhere along the lines when Jalen Brown entered the dunk contest. I said, "Watch him make a dunk with his left hand." <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he sent it to thing. us. So yeah, that was his. Uh, was that his first or second dunk? I think it was like his second okay. or something. Um, <clears throat> but the dunk contest, something needs to change, and I don't know what it is. It's been the talk of the last week, but my biggest problem with the dunk contest, and this was before we even found out that the judges were terrible. They showed the graphic when they brought up the dunk contest and the rules. And at the very bottom, it said dunks will be scored from 40 to 50. Now, does that make any sense to you that you are automatically a 40 just being there? To me, that makes no sense. Sometimes people need to be humbled. Jalen Brown attempted an alley-oop D Brown dunk. And he didn't cover his face until he landed. He deserved less than a like that, fifteen. Yeah, fifteen being just for the idea of it. Cool, it was a good idea, a nod to Boston. But it was terrible execution. And he, for that dunk, somehow got an okay score. And he made it to the final. Over Jacob Toppin, who did a dunk that basically Obi Toppin did um, in his game in his dunk contest win, it was still better than anything Jalen Brown good. was doing. Yeah, how many Hawkes his windmill was it over Shaq? Yeah, his first his, dunk. his windmill over Shaq was better than Jalen Brown's dunks. Yeah, and then Mac McClung did a dunk where he literally grabbed the ball below his waist. And then he brought it up like midway. That first, that was impressive. Let go. That first one was impressive. Grabbed back on and flushed it. And he didn't get all 50. But he didn't. He scored lower than Jalen yeah. Brown. I think he had the most creative something. dunk of the contest. And this this has happened a couple times where like they get these older guys. The the problem was the inverse happened before. They used to get Dr. J to be a judge. And he yeah. and he would harshly judge everybody mm -hmm. every time. And it's like, dude, what do you want to see? You didn't do anything special <laughs> back then compared to what they're doing now. And Dr. J is one of the greatest dunkers of all time. But there's like this weird thing when you get these judges up there. Um, and, and I don't know. And I felt like Dominique was like being way too gracious for a lot of people. What was Jalen Brown bringing the... Who was the kid that wore the Dominique Wilkins jersey? And nobody Who knows. Who was that kid? Nobody knows. What? Nobody knows. It was supposed to be that like... That confused me so much. So, I guess it was supposed to... And he had to, a high top fade, yeah. like... It's supposed to look like what? Dominique. But it, it was like this thing like, Dominique is teaching me this dunk. 
as a kid, I, I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> weird. It made he, no sense. He had so many theatrics. I just saw a child that was like made to look. I was like, what? Yeah. And uh, the windmill wasn't even that good. No. That he did. Uh, no. Uh, and I don't know if you noticed, he stuck his tongue out like every dunk. Li- uh, listen, like at least he was having fun, I guess. That was like Andre Drummond levels of just get out of here. Yeah. Just go. So, I don't know. And then he dunked over Kai Sinat, which. Great. Five three Sitting guy. in the chair. Sit- Sitting in the chair. Oh man, it's rough. I, I don't even. I don't even know it's what rough. to say. So the other thing I wanted to bring up about the dunk contest, really quick, Stephen A. Smith <laughs> pointed out and called out LeBron for ruining the dunk contest. He said this for a while now. <laughs> Agree or disagree? I I'm fifty fifty on it, and it's like fifty serious, fifty half. Like yeah. I uh, I don't know. It, it makes sense, but it's probably a little too far. Again, yeah. as much as we like to hate on LeBron. If LeBron did it, people would have followed. Yeah. That is a fact. Right. He would have set a trend of like, if he came in and said, I'm bringing back superstars in the dunk contest, mm-hmm. it would have done something. He's LeBron James. Yeah. But not only did he decide not to do it, he teased the world. Mm-hmm. And I believe 2009, <laughs> when he said, I am putting my name in next year's dunk contest and the judges went crazy and us kids were like, Oh my God, he's going to do it. Yeah. And he was in street clothes the next year, just mm-hmm. like everybody else was on the sideline. Yeah. And that's the thing. Like everybody points out the dunk contest used to be the thing. That's why it's the last contest of the night. You had guys like Vince Carter, Kobe Bryant, Tracy McGrady, all these stars. And then you go back to the eighties, Jordan Wilkins, like big name guys. And now we got a G leaguer winning it. Listen, now, I, Mac McClung is a great dunker. Yeah. But at the end of the day, nobody really sees him. To me, the the biggest prop. Did you see the quote Anthony Edwards had when they asked him about a competitive All Star game? Oh, yeah. That he basically just said it's it's like vacation. And he said it's a break for us. Mm-hmm. It's fun. It's not something I take seriously. Right. We're just the, out there to dunk a few times and shoot some jumpers yeah that's basically what he said i'm misquoting him overall right but he he basically said it's just fun yeah i'm not going to be competitive which to a degree is i think that i think that is spilled over to the events as well yeah i think the entire thought process of the entire weekend has just become eh yeah who cares and it's like let's let's just yeah let's just lay back Mm -hmm. but it's like people are pointing out like there's a lot more money in the league nowadays there's not as much competitive fire because it, at the end of the day, they're still getting a paycheck. I can't entirely blame them for that, but it just stinks for the fans at times. Um, because you think right now, man, if you got Aaron Gordon, Zach Levine, John Morant, and Anthony Edwards – to do a dunk contest, it, the the ratings would be out of this world. It would be insane. It would be like Levine and Gordon's last ride, mm-hmm. and John Morant and Anthony Edwards taking up. It would be it would be insane. Right. I'd be like nose to the TV, mm-hmm. watching every single dunk. Yeah. The other thing that stinks about the All Star Weekend, and I don't know if you remember this, like All Star Weekend is just slowed down tremendously as far as pacing throughout the night, because. Back when I was growing up, there used to be, like, I don't know if this is fully true. I don't know the exact number. But there was, like, 12 to 16 three-point players that were in the three-point contest. And then the dunk contest used to have, like, I want to say, like, eight guys at some point. Oh, that, that was, that was like, back when we were younger. Right. Well, that's what I'm yeah, saying. It, it was a lot deeper when we were younger. Right. But now you have, I mean, you still have a good amount of three-point guys at yeah. this point. And then you had you only have four dunkers, and it goes pretty quick. Um, it's just it's just interesting to me. And I know like if you can't even do the dunk contest with more than four guys now because nobody wants to do it, but it just takes away from adding more people into it. I don't know. The skills contest we talked about it before it in the preview. It was just it was, like it was a joke. we thought. It turned out terrible. Uh, nobody so, tries. This, listen, Scotty Barnes. I think that's all you have to say. About the skills competition. I was excited for the skills competition. In the very first team, they went the wrong way dribbling 
twice. Scotty Barnes loses the ball. Listen, bro. Him falling over and laughing and uh, like just tossing. Uh, Anthony Edwards oh only God. shooting with his left hand. Listen, man. It's tough. It's I, tough. I sent you that clip of Darren Williams in the yeah. skills competition. And that's the stuff I remember. And the level of effort. Mm-hmm. And how like cleanly they wanted to make everything. Oh, yep. It, and that was like when they first went to that. When they first went to the skills competition, Darren Williams got in it. Tony Parker got in it. Chris Paul, still prime Steve Nash. Steve Nash. Jason that's Kidd. Was, yep. All and, the best point guards in the game did mm-hmm. it, and they wanted to prove something. Yeah. That is the biggest problem. Mm-hmm. All of that competitive, uh is it's it's gone. Yeah. It was it was in like every part of the league when we were younger. Yeah, everything meant something. Everything, the players were all in. Mm-hmm. Even when we were younger, the dunk contest was kind of coming back because in the finals that ha- I mean in the nineties it had a bit of a fall off. Right. But when Jason Richardson came back up, people started taking it seriously again. I was gonna say my like my I'm spoiled, and I'll be honest <laughs> because when I started watching All Star Weekend, what I can remember. Is Vince Carter in 2000. I See, was eight I, years old. The first one I remember is Jason Richardson in like 02. Mm-hmm. That's the first one I remember. And that's that's where I was going. Like I got Vince Carter when I was eight years old. He's my favorite player of all time for a reason. Then we got into the Jason Richardson years where he won back-to-back years. The first full contest I remember is Fred Jones, Jason Richardson, mm-hmm. 03 yeah. in LA. That's the first full one I remember. And I remember like Jason Richardson. It was 04 at LA. They had like I can't remember which one. Yeah. During the Jason Richardson contest, they had like lights off. That's when you had all the flashing yeah. cameras. The atmosphere was real. Right. Like I didn't know who Fred Jones was. Yeah. And when he did that lean and dunk, like mm-hmm. I knew who Fred Jones was for the rest of my life. Yep. I used to look him up on two K rosters. Like that's that guy. Yeah. That almost beat Jason. Like mm-hmm. it meant something. Right. And I know like the dunks that they did back then don't really hold up to what they did today like now Jason Richardson would destroy but, people today but other people I understand yeah yeah so it's it's just crazy and I always say even I think even Josh Smith had some I love some that that Denver dunk concert man you yeah. you're making me <laughs> emotional now because <laughs> these are the ones I really remember right the 05 contest in Denver 06 yeah. was when Nate, Rod- Nate, Nate, Nate Robinson mm-hmm. won his first contest. Yep. And then like, they had the Nate I can Rob- rattle them off after that. They had the Nate Robinson Dwight Howard rivalry for a little while. Yeah. Then we got into Blake Griffin. We had the prop dunk era. The Shouts out to Gerald Green that actually did an interesting prop dunk. Probably the most underrated one in in contest yeah. history. Before blown out the candle. Before they really looked at the replay before. Um yeah, that was that was unfortunate. And then we had a lull for a little while. We had the the the, Listen, Jeremy the Evans. team the team dunk contest. The team contest when when all stars agreed to do it. Yeah. And then they made it a team contest. Yeah. And it lasted like fifteen minutes. Right. Yeah. And then we finally got Zach Levine and Aaron Gordon, and people thought, "Holy crap, the dunk contest is back." And then Aaron Gordon got jobbed. Yeah. And then he said, "He's done." And Zach Levine won two titles. He's done. <laughs> Which you can't fault either of them for because they they did it, but man, it just leaves you it leaves you hanging. Wants makes you want more, and I don't know I don't know how they're gonna do it going forward. The three point contest is still good. Maybe they put the three point contest last. I wish I was awake last. for that. I I woke up when Dame was winning, mm-hmm. and then I fell asleep again and missed the dunk. Contest. Four guys tied at twenty six, which was great. That's cool. Made it exciting, and then Steph versus Sabrina was good. I missed that one too. I. Yeah, it looked really exciting. That's something they can definitely lean on. A lot of people are like, if Caitlin Clark goes to WNBA, they can yeah. do Steph and Dame versus Caitlin and Sabrina. Like that'd be pretty cool. Even though Dame and Steph are gonna win, but it, Sabrina showed. Sabrina like, scored twenty six. She's right there. Yeah. Steph had twenty nine. Steph would have won the three point contest. No surprise. Um, but like maybe they put that to the prime time slot. Just move the dunk contest out. Start showing people it's not as important. At least for a few years, they need to make a change. Yeah. I, listen, I've heard players, this suggestion would, would make things more competitive again. Either a one-on-one or a two-on-two contest. Mm. Like a tournament. Yeah. Where guys just, you got to show off your skill. There's nobody hiding in this. Mm-hmm. But that's the you problem. Gotta, you got to play to win. 
But that's the problem, though. Then it becomes a dunk contest where it's like guys don't want to be embarrassed. I think all star all stars these level of young dudes they want to show off their bags. Maybe I, I think that's one thing they want to show off, like how much skill they actually have. Hmm. I think Maybe. they'd be in for it, especially with a cash prize. Yeah, like if I, I guarantee Kyrie would be in yeah. just to show everybody he's the greatest. Like he has the greatest handles in league history. Put Kyrie Pat, would be in. Put Pat Bev in there. <laughs> Because he'll start talking to him. He's going to try to just stop everybody. Just let him get destroyed. But, like, <laughs> he'd be the reason because he could call people out and then they'll be like, no, I'm going to get in this then. I want I want him announcing on the side. I don't want him playing. I want Pat Bev as a commentator. There you go. That would be hilarious. Yeah. Um, I don't know if anybody knows. We didn't talk about the All-Star game because we're not going to. They scored almost 400 points. I think it was 397. Cat scored 50. And he didn't win the Congratulations. But I looked at his box score. He had, like, 27 attempts or something. I, it was Didn't great. Dame win MVP? Yeah, he did. Because yeah. he hit some deep, deep threes. Tyrese Halliburton almost did it. Um, but it's just boring. There's nothing. Like, it was a blowout, too. The East won by, like, 20 or 30. Um, they they got to figure something out for that, too. Um, and I don't know what it is. But right now, the All-Star game and all that, just not what. I think the target score a few years ago worked. Yeah. And then it just... For some reason, they didn't stick with exactly how they did it. Yeah, because guys got really competitive mm-hmm. once, like the win was. Well, in somebody brought yeah. that up. wasn't Wasn't it that year that that team got home court advantage from it? I don't remember them actually putting playoff but stuff on it. I don't either. But somebody mentioned it, and I I couldn't remember if that was true or not. But yeah, I I don't know. I'm not sure. But All Star Weekend has passed us, and. I guess we're getting ready for NBA playoffs, getting closer. March Madness is around but, uh, the corner. Yeah, so I'm not worried about NBA right yeah. now. The other one little tidbit about the NBA that I want to bring up, Beef Stew getting arrested. The, that guy. He should have been he, traded. He should have been traded. He has some issues that he needs to work out. Mm-hmm. He and, really does. And I brought this up with my brother. It's like Beef Stew, we would have loved that energy. If it was used correctly, we learned it with Rashid and we learned the opposite side with CJ GJ for the lions. Like you like that energy, but when you don't show up with that energy and use it to your advantage, oh, we don't want it. And that's what beef stew is kind of showing. Listen, Kevin Garnett was the most intense player probably in basketball history. Mm-hmm. He said all types of wild stuff. A right. lot of dudes wanted to fight him on a, like a nightly basis. Mm-hmm. Kevin Garnett wasn't fighting anybody. Right. He was playing mind games mm-hmm. and motivating himself with all that craziness. Right. Beef Stew was just out here being wild. Yeah. But even guys like back in the, like Ron Artest, who was a knucklehead, straight knucklehead. He, he also, after yeah. years we've learned, he right. had some actual issues but, going on. But at He the, was a knucklehead, but he had right. things going on. But at the same time, he was able to back it up. He oh, was, yeah, he was one, locked in. He was an all-star level player. <laughs> right. He was one of the best players at that time. Yeah. So, like... Indiana fans, I don't know how they feel, I guess, but they probably embraced him to a certain degree until they, he hurt his team. But, like, you like that intensity. If Beef Stew would have been that guy, I might not have had a big of a problem with it. When you punch somebody before the game with nothing on the line, no yeah. game even being played, I don't want that. I don't want that on my team. And it's just unfortunate. Um, so I don't know what they're going to do with him at this point because what do you do? Now, now he basically lost all his trade value, I think, um, and he's we gave him a, gave him an extension, so I don't know, it's unfortunate, but yeah, just wanted to bring that up. All right, college <clears throat> basketball heating up more and more and more. We've already seen Purdue get knocked off again. Ohio U- State. UConn just lost last night. UConn they losing. Got popped by Creighton. I thought that was crazy because when I heard that that game was going on, I said, oh, Creighton, they're the team that usually kind of falls apart at some point. And I was like, ah, UConn's going to blow them out. I'm not going to watch that game. And then I checked the That's scores a, before I went to bed. A crazy stat I didn't know until after that game. UConn is 0-21 yeah. Yeah. against top 10 teams on the road. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how many years, but yeah, 0-21. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, so take that for what you will. But uh, college basketball has gotten 
pretty intense lately. Um, and MSU, once again, they beat Michigan. They've been rolling a little bit the last couple weeks. They've been playing pretty solid. Malik Hall's been going good. And then they lose to Iowa last night. At home. There, and, there are so many layers to that loss. And I have no... There are so many layers. No thoughts about it. And it's just, again, every time we talk about this team, it's, it's the just, same issue. Uh, it's a stinking roller coaster. It's the I, definition of insanity. It is. Doing the same thing. Right. And it's over just, and over again. Like, I feel like I'm, every time I'm like, oh, I'm at a loss for words. I don't understand. Oh, they had a good week. Oh, but then they lost. I, it's frustrating. Do you know who Iowa's starting center is, Joey? No, I don't. Uh, it's a kid named Owen Freeman. Hmm. He's from Moline, Illinois. He's averaging 11 and 6 on 65% from the field. Mm-hmm. Pretty good college big numbers, right? Yeah. Uh, 6'10", 230. He was uh, not even a four-star recruit. Mm-hmm. And he's a true freshman. Yeah. Yeah. And last night in that win... Uh, let me pull it up. Uh, well, he only had eight, two, and two, mm-hmm. but he didn't miss a shot. And the bigs for Michigan State should we look at should we look at their stats? Uh, maybe. Maddie Sissoko, uh, zero points, one rebound, five minutes. Carson Cooper, twelve minutes, mm-hmm. offer two, three point seven rebounds. Yeah. Well, just look at I don't know how to pronounce it. Ben Crike, Crike, Cricky, Cricky. Yeah. Not, yeah, I'll, really fun name, Ben Cricky. Came from Belmont, I'm pretty sure. Um, but he's a senior, 6'9". He had 18 he, he puts up numbers. and 14 rebounds. And he's only 6'9". Yeah. That Listen, tells you the state of the big men for Michigan State. Not only is Tom Izzo missing on guys like Owen Freeman, a true freshman at Iowa who's averaging 10 and 6, Ben Cricky was a transfer mm-hmm. from Belmont that many schools were looking at. Mm-hmm. Including a Big Ten school mm-hmm. in Iowa. Ben Cricky was there. Yeah. Averaging 14 and 5, 54% shooting. Mm-hmm. He stuck with his guys. Mm-hmm. How long does this. <laughs> how, how long? Like, I, I, I think that right there is the, the prime example. And when you look at Michigan State's box score, mm-hmm. but the fact that you are missing out on guys. That can come in and play for you. You won't embrace the transfers. A transfer comes in and gets 14 rebounds on you. And you're sticking with the guys that can't play. Mm-hmm. Which at the, the end of the day, though, the, the wild part about all the transfer stuff, Michigan State's best player is a transfer portal yeah. player. <laughs> make it make sense. Is hey Amen. And then... Again, we keep talking about it. But the development for this team has not been there in over a decade, probably. There's guys. There's a few in there. There's maybe guys here and there. But, like, Maddie Sissoko started this game. Thank goodness he only played five minutes. But you have a starter that played only five minutes. Yeah. That doesn't make sense to me. That you are starting a guy and he only plays five minutes. Maybe he shouldn't be a starter. Just my thought. I tend to agree with your logic there, Joey. <laughs> just, just my You're thought. You're making a point. Um, You're making some points. And the other thing is, when Michigan State was winning their games the last couple weeks, um, or playing better in general, they had played small ball. Cohen Carr was getting more time. Granted, this was against Penn State and your lowly Michigan Wolverines. But they they played small ball. They played a little better. And, and then all of a sudden, they try to go back to playing bigs. And again, we talked about it a lot. This team doesn't have any bigs that are worth anything for the most part. We said, let's just try Xavier Booker. No. We're not going to. Okay, fine. Whatever. Uh, and then, like, you got guys like Jackson Kohler and stuff. Like, he's trying to work his way back, but it, 
it's not it's not working. I don't I don't know. So he just, need, yeah, he needs more time to come so back. So just from continue his with what's going well right now. The only thing that makes me feel okay for them going into the tournament right now is Malik Hall has actually been pretty consistent the last few like last month. Last few probably. weeks, yeah. Um that's like the only thing. And everybody's always like, oh yeah, but it's Izzo in March and Izzo in April. He's gonna turn it around. Uh, okay, but you can't you can't rely on that every time. Outside of twenty nineteen, when was the last time Izzo made an Izzo run? Yeah, I don't know. Last year they made a run. They didn't. It, they got to the Sweet Sixteen, didn't they? Yeah, when Kansas State beat them. Yeah, yeah can't I believe Sweet Sixteen or Elite Eight even. I think it was the Sweet 16. Because Kansas State lost to Florida Atlantic in the Elite Eight. Yes. Yeah. And Florida Atlantic made it to the final four. Yeah. Good call. Yes. Um, so it's like, okay, that was their their decent run. And I hate to say it, my, my family hated me for saying it, that I felt like Kansas State was going to win that game from the get-go. And they did because they just had they had that extra thing yeah. that it didn't seem like Michigan State had. And that's the problem. And I don't know how to fix it. I'm, I, I'm not. I know basketball, but I'm, and I say all these things about like ripping up on Tom Izzo and all that. But at the end of the day, like I don't know any better than Tom Izzo realistically. But I just realize that there's certain things that this team is missing. It's obvious to see when you don't have the guys. Right. It's obvious. Mm-hmm. You have three to four players that you can count on. Sometimes mm-hmm. to get you points. Yeah. Tyson Walker is the guarantee. Hoggard some nights. Mm-hmm. Jordan Aiken, not Jordan, Jay Aiken some nights. Malik Hall, really good last month. Mm-hmm. Outside of that, what are you believing in? Yeah. But I won't same- disrespect Trey Holloman <laughs> because he did something. Yeah. He's shooting 41% from three for the season. Mm-hmm. The volume isn't high, yeah. but he's hitting them. Right. So I'll respect Trey Holloman for that. Mm hmm. The, the hard thing is, like, Malik Hall has been playing good. But, like, at the in the back of your mind, you're like, when he's going to go back to that you know, five points and, like, two rebounds kind of night? Like, you hope it doesn't happen, but I've seen it happen so many times now. He's always the guy that it's like, if Malik Hall can stay consistent, he's the one that I think that could push this team over the top and make a run. But he just hasn't shown the consistency enough to where I can even believe it, even though he's been doing it for the last month. I just, at the end of the day, I'm like, okay, well, eventually he's probably going to have a, an off night, which, I mean, it happens. That's that's how basketball goes. But when you get into this time of the year, you just you need to be at your A game. This is when those seniors yeah. are supposed to be at the top of their game. Mm-hmm. And like we said, Malik Hall, he's playing well. Yeah. But – don't know what you're going to get from game to game. Mm-hmm. AJ Hoggard, don't know what you're going to get from game to game. Yeah. I personally think this is, they're a 50 50 shot of, of losing their first game in the Big Ten tournament mm-hmm. or winning like two or three games. Yeah. It's 50 50 to me. Mm-hmm. Like if Tyson Walker heats up and just goes like Kimbo Walker mode, mm-hmm. they could do something weirdly special just out of nowhere. Right. But. I, this team just doesn't have that extra – that thing, like you said. Mm-hmm. They don't have that thing where most teams, they can see it during the regular season. Kansas State fans saw that there was something happening right. with Kansas State last year. Mm-hmm. With Marquise Noel and Keontae Johnson, going into the tournament, they were in a, in a groove that most teams just weren't. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what – Michigan State fan could tell me that they see that in this team. Yeah. Most teams, I, I always check on like fans' comments on Twitter after wins and losses. Fans are just searching for answers right now. Mm-hmm. They they don't know where it's gonna come from. Yeah. And if it tells you anything about like how I feel about this Michigan State team, like I would say my all time favorite Michigan State basketball players that I can think of off the top of my head are Brandon Dawson and Aaron Henry. And those guys were just... I did not realize Aaron Henry was <laughs> meant that much to you. Well, not like... Like, he had that that time in... 
was it the 2019 run where he just seemed like he was the guy? And it was just, it was 2021. Was it when they were they were like on the verge of not making the tournament? Okay, yeah, he, he was went just down pull, the he was single handedly pulling out games. Yeah, and like the, every and game. in that moment, I was like, man, this this guy's a dog, and I like that, and so I like him for that reason. Um, so in recent memory, he's one that I liked a lot, but I like those guys that just put their head down and just go go play. Um, and I mean, there's been other guys that do that for this team, but those are just standouts to me personally. But I don't, I don't see anybody like that right now on this team. And that's, that's always been the thing about Michigan State is like you have like Tyson Walker, Cassius Winston, even Denzel Valentine or something. Like you have that kind of key guy that plays really well. But then you're going to have that secondary player like Brandon Dawson, Xavier Tillman, a glue guy. Yeah. That just, he's like, whenever it's time to make a play, they make a play. I'm going to do the dirty work. I'm going to do what you need to do. Yeah. And as much as I hate it, Matt McQuaid also was kind of that guy. On that tournament run, he was he was nails yeah. during that tournament run. And, again, I, I don't see that kind of guy for this team. And I don't know where, where it would come from either. Like, last year it was Jade Nakins in the tournament. Is he going to be able to flip the switch again? I don't, I don't know. You would have hoped that he would have – we've said it a couple times. I would have hoped that he would have just had a breakout season this year, yeah. and he hasn't. So for him to have to turn that on in the tournament again, I don't know if I can trust it. So I'm in a in a weird spot once again. And again, I'm probably sounding like a hater for a lot of people, but at the end of the day, I want this team to be successful. That's the, that's the problem. I want to see them do well, but it's like the Pistons. Chris always called me a hater because I didn't like Andre Drummond being the number one option. I didn't like this. I didn't like that. But it's because I want the best for these teams. So I'm going to be hypercritical, probably to the point of being too critical and not just enjoying it. But th- that's how my fandom works. Um, luckily for Michigan, I don't even have to care about them. Because, Preach. <laughs> because, Preach, sir. Like, I mean, again, we talked about that before. But like, even with Juwan coming in, I haven't really liked the regime that they've had, the Hunter Dickinson era and all that. There wasn't too many guys that I enjoyed watching, but his first few teams were beeline guys, mm-hmm. his best teams. Right, but you go back to beeline era, and you again you had certain like glue pieces, like Abdul Rockman. People forget about that guy. Uh, listen, one of my favorite <laughs> players in Michigan. He hit a shot every time. Yeah, they needed one. Mm-hmm. Everybody, yeah. uh, the other fan favorite, Spike Albrick. Like people loved him. Um, but, like, those teams, they just had something. And we, we don't get that right now. And so, again, it's nice that I don't have to worry about Michigan because they're trash. They're going to be bottom of the barrel Big Ten. Um, don't, th- they play Nebraska this week, right? Uh, they play at Northwestern. Oh, Northwestern. Uh, tomorrow. Okay. They'll probably get destroyed. They play against Purdue at home. They'll probably get destroyed. They play at Rutgers. Okay. They'll probably lose. Yeah, probably. But I think Michigan State is in a really – I've said this before, so it's nothing new. They're in a strange spot in their program, Mm -hmm. not just as like this year's team. If you look at the Big Ten standings, they're in between two teams. Yeah. Two programs that have no real history of success. Two programs that are on the rise. Mm -hmm. Northwestern is the head of them at four. Chris Collins has built something that is close to impossible to build at Northwestern. A, cons- a consistently good, like, tough, smart basketball program mm-hmm. with North- Northwestern. They're better than Michigan State right now. Mm-hmm. They just beat Indiana on the road. Yeah. And right behind them is Nebraska, who outside of, like, the year in the 90s with Ty Lue at point guard. <laughs> right. And those, like, short few years – where um, Tim Miles was their coach, hmm. where they had good teams for like two years yeah. in the 2010s. Nebraska's done nothing. And I think if you look at Nebraska, they're right behind Michigan State in the standings. They have a few guys where you look like if they get into the tournament, that's dangerous. Mm-hmm. Casey Tomonaga can drop 30 on you mm-hmm. and hit like eight threes. Yeah. Rink Mast is like a beast in the post, and he can hit threes on the outside. 
they have some guys that are dangerous. Yeah. C.J. Wiltshire can come off the bench and hit you with five or six threes. Mm-hmm. It's wild that you can't – you look at Michigan State and you just can't think about that. Yeah. Outside of Tyson Walker, there's no guarantee of anybody doing anything. Right. And, yeah, Nebraska and Northwestern are on the rise, and they're kind of – they're on the same level as Michigan State right now mm-hmm. and better in some aspects. Yeah, and I think the only thing that's like kind of saving Michigan State right now, Michigan's down, Ohio State's down, yeah, Maryland's down. Speaking of Ohio Indiana. State, they beat Purdue with their interim coach, which is hilarious. Right. But yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. But like all these Big Ten teams that we've seen towards the top have fallen down a little bit, and now that's partially because of Northwestern and Nebraska being better nowadays. Um, but there's a little bit of a shift in the Big Ten, and I think that's it's kind of saving Michigan State. But the problem is, I think a lot of your average Michigan State fans are okay with being middle of the pack. If the if the team makes the tournament, we're good. Which doesn't make sense to me because Michigan State fans always talk about all the Final Fours they made, all the tournament appearances they make, but yet there's like this disconnect. Like like you said, it's like they make the tournament and they're okay. <laughs> Okay, but we don't look good going into the tournament. We made a, we had a special run last year, and we made it to the Sweet Sixteen. Like that's realistically, that's not that special. And we lost for what your program is. Right? Are are they a new blue blood or not? (sighs) Are they one of those programs that people look at as top tier because they still get these preseason, the preseason hype? Mm-hmm. As we see, they were ranked top five in the preseason. Right, everybody expected them to be one of the best teams in the country. Yeah, bar none. Mm-hmm. They're definitely, and a, this is what they're giving them right now. And, and they're for sure a blue blood. But like you're saying, like a spin on it. Like, are they a new blue blood? But even what I'm saying, if you're a new blue blood, like Villanova under Jay Wright, mm-hmm. they became we expect championships. Yeah. Jay Wright won two of them in a six year span. Mm-hmm. Still, like everybody had knew what was going to happen. And knew what to expect under Jay Wright. Yeah. What are the expectations under Tom Izzo right now? Right. Make the tournament. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's a good question. It really is. Um. All right. Uh, with our last couple minutes, we just want to go over some more college basketball, look at the top 25 again. Um. And unfortunately, it's going to change again because UConn, like we said, they just lost this week. Yeah, they'll still be top three, but yeah. But Great win for Creighton. Houston's going to go back above them. Houston's going to go back to number yeah. one. Uh, they've rattled off a bunch of wins. Um, they just beat Iowa State, who's moved yeah. up to number and six. They absolutely pop Texas. Yes. Um, Purdue going to fall again a little bit. And then Arizona should bounce back up slightly. So we're going to have a bunch of bouncing around a little bit. Tennessee had a good win over Missouri. Kind of a comeback win, but they, they got it done. Uh Marquette got blown out by UConn. So yeah, they they had they they don't have a much of that spark that they had last year. Right. Uh Duke should go back up a little bit. Um Kansas, they might just stay right where they're at because they've been back and forth lately. Yeah. Um same with North Carolina. We get to the point where now these teams are kind of bouncing around. Creighton's gonna definitely go up. I don't know how high they're gonna go, but they'll probably crack top ten, I would think. Um, and then we got like, we got those SEC teams, Alabama and Auburn, um, having a good season at 13 and 14. Uh, didn't Dayton just lose? Am um, I thinking, yeah, they, Dayton lost to VC 49, 47 a few yeah, games ago. Yeah. That was, but that was more of a, yeah, mm-hmm. they, they won their games outside of that. Yeah. They popped Duquesne beat Fordham by eight. Right. Yeah. Dayton is kind of rolling. Yeah, one team that snuck into it since we last talked to was St. Mary's. They knocked off Gonzaga. Listen, I, I brought up Aiden Mahaney. Mm-hmm. I think it was either three weeks ago or a month ago. But they're undefeated in the West Coast Conference right now. Yeah. And they that went over at San Francisco. I watched the second half last night. Mm-hmm. It was a really big win. And they, they have some pieces that could do something in the tournament. Yeah. And people probably laugh at San Francisco, but I don't know if people realize San Francisco has been a pretty good program the last few years. Yeah. So. The top of the West Coast Conference is legit, legit really good. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we got uh, San Diego State, South Carolina, unfortunately, your your darling team. They got beat by 40 at Auburn. <laughs> they got smacked. Listen, they, they had a few of those losses in them. They're, they're still not the yeah. most talented team in the country. Right. It's going to happen. And then they lost to LSU, 
right after that. They needed to be humbled. But, um, I mean, they're still having Lost a, a great tough, season. Yeah. Uh, the fun new entry, Washington State. I haven't watched a single game of theirs. I haven't either, but I noticed and they, they are were in. 20 and 6. Yeah. That is surprising. But uh, they're going to play Arizona tomorrow night. So we'll find out where they're really at. Um, and then we got Colorado State jumping back in. Texas Tech. I think this is another one of those Texas Tech years that they might be able to make some sneaky run. They got a few guys. Just because of the way they play. Yeah. Uh, they blew out Kansas a couple weeks ago. Um, played somewhat close with Iowa State, and then they just beat TCU. So watch out for them a little bit. Florida in the top 25. Haven't seen Florida in a minute. And then uh, BYU. And then there's a bunch of teams right behind them that are looking to crack the top 25. Michigan State was one of those teams until they lost to Iowa. Yeah. Um, any other teams that you want to uh, bring up that you've watched recently? We only got like two minutes, but if there's a team or two that you wanted to bring up um, that could um, make some noise or do something. I was going to bring up St. Mary's because, like I said, mm-hmm. they're 13 in one conference, and they're kind of on a heater. I don't know if they're going to, like, waste their heater during the regular season. Yeah. It'll be tough to waste it and then lose in the tournament. Mm-hmm. But they're on a really nice roll right now, and I think people should pay more attention to them. South Florida. Okay. Listen, man. It is incredible what Abdur uh uh what's what's his last name? It's Abdur Rahim. He has one other name, but Sharif? No, not Sharif, not the NBA player. Amir Abdur Rahim, I think that's his name. Okay. He was the coach at Kennesaw State, the team that won that made the tournament okay. last year. Mm-hmm. He took that team for being winless in 2019 or 2020. Within three years, he got Kennesaw State to the tournament. Mm-hmm. Never been done. Takes this job at South Florida, a school with no basketball history, really. I don't know if they've ever made a, like a any type of tournament run. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you the last time they made the tournament. Right now, South Florida is 19-5, and 12-1 and one in conference, 13-2 and two at home, and they've won 11 straight. Okay. And this is his first year as coach at South Florida. Mm-hmm. Now, he brought a few guys from Kennesaw State with him. Chris Youngblood is a really good player. He's one of them. Yeah. But it it is unbelievable to me that he hasn't been a head coach for very long, and he's doing the impossible mm-hmm. at multiple programs. Yeah. I, I He deserves so much credit. He deserves more eyes mm-hmm. because – it, it's it's awesome what he's doing. Yeah. He he could possibly get in as if he doesn't win the conference tournament as one of the um, what's the term when you're like in a lower conference and you could still get in, like without winning the conference tournament. I'm forgetting the term, but even if they don't win their conference tourney, I still think they could get in, okay. even though they're in the American. Okay. Because F I F A U Florida Atlantic, who was uh, preseason ranked. Mm-hmm. They're third in the conference right now. Yeah, Charlotte is also having a surprise season with the first year head coach. They're eleven and two in conference. FAU was twenty and six and ten and three in conference. Mm-hmm. And US seven FAU just played last Sunday. South Florida won. Yeah, so knocked them out of the top twenty five. Yeah, crazy impressive season by South Florida right now. Yeah, they deserve all the credit in the world. Mm-hmm. And Syracuse, two teams out of the ACC actually. Syracuse, who I think is really sneaky. I think they could possibly make a little run in the ACC tournament because they have guys that can go off and just go on heaters. Yeah. Their best player is Judah Mintz, who's averaging 18. But Chris Bell, he had eight threes in the first half against NC State last night. Yeah, you sent me that picture. When you have a guy that can do stuff like that, mm-hmm. you you're in almost every game. Right. But also, I'm a huge fan of Wake Forest and what they've done this season, <laughs> honestly. I, I I enjoyed like their nickname as a kid, the Demon Deacons. Yeah. The type of players they used to have, the Chris Pauls, the Jeff Teagues. Tim Duncan. Tim Duncan. I didn't see Tim Duncan, but yeah. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> Al Farouk Aminu was there. No. There's a name. Okay. Al Farouk. But they got a guy named Hunter Salas, 
who was a five star coming out of high school, went to Gonzaga, never lived up to his billing, honestly at Gonzaga. Mm-hmm. He's averaging eighteen for Wake Forest, shooting forty one percent from three, fifty percent from the field. He's a guy that's going up NBA draft boards because he's six six. He's athletic. He's got game. He can shoot. He's one of the big reasons why Wake Forest is on their way to potentially making the tournament because they're up to fourth in the ACC now. Yeah. And now that Virginia is kind of dropping off, they could potentially get up to third. Mm-hmm. And they also have uh, Hunter Salas is a two guard, but their other two guard, Cam Hildreth, is from England. Okay. A, t- a kid a few years ago that they just took a flyer on overseas. Uh, he's averaging 13, 5, and 3. 44% from the field, 35 from three. He's a kid that's got some game, too. They, they're they a really interesting team if you watch them. Yeah. They even have a kid that I think is uh, Joey Tysick-ish. Okay. Parker Fredrickson. Okay. <laughs> Freshman out of Oklahoma. He's just a three-point shooter. Okay. Wow. They put him out there, and he just puts him up. He's He, he, he hits him, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's 6'3", kid, 195. Really good shooter. They bring off the bench. Okay. So I, I like Wake Forest a lot. I like their roster. I like what they're building. Yeah, right. They're seventeen and nine, nine and six in conference right now. Nice. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll give you one to watch tonight: Colorado State, New Mexico. Isaiah Stevens. That's exciting. Jalen House should be a good matchup. Actually, um, gives you something to watch for teams that you don't usually see too often. Um, next week we'll do more college basketball talk. We'll get into some more nitty gritty. Um, we'll start talking tournament previews a little bit, and. Uh, trying to figure out guests for for March Madness show because that's coming up crazy enough and it's our favorite time of the year but uh, this has been Views from the Sidelines and we'll see you guys uh, next time Oakland is first in the horizon Greg Campy if you mess this up I'm not even going to go there just don't mess it up I was going to say